Hello, family of grace. Pastor Chris here. I am the online campus pastor here at Grace Central Coast. We are a gospel-centered, multi-campus church on the central coast of California, and we are all about helping people find and follow Jesus. If you're new here, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. You can email me, chris at gracecentralcoast.org. I'd love to know that I got to worship with you here today. I will reply to you. I would love to uh, pray over you and your family, even if you're not new. Email me. Reach out. I'd love to connect with you and with those who are worshiping with us together here today. We're going to kick off our time of worship like we normally do by reading from God's Word. We're going to read from Psalm 105 in just a second. And I really want to invite you to take this moment to uh, just gather your heart and your thoughts uh, into a, a place where you can respond to the Lord and worship. We're going to start our morning worshiping together. And so I want you to consider uh, the things that God has done and the the being that he's revealed himself to be. And uh, I want you to respond to that in worship, however you feel comfortable this morning. So whether that's singing along with me or reading along with the lyrics, uh, praying these lyrics, you can journal, you can draw any way that you can respond to who God is and worship together today. So we're going to read from Psalm 105 now. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. Let's praise him together now. There were walls between us By the cross you came and broke them down You broke them down There were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then our came alive greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me, your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life I'm back to life He is song awaken All creation singing We alive Cause you're alive You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call me name and then our king alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. In what a love we found, death can't hold us down. Shout it out.
And let's remember that love is not just some uh, love or some thought up in heaven floating around. It's love here with us. Uh, Through Christ, God incarnate, and then sending his helper, the Holy Spirit. Just 
Sing it again. He is jealous for me. He is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so are his portion is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes if his grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like You don't just love well. You don't just love perfectly. You are love. We thank you for that. We experience that through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would remind us of that today as we continue worshiping you. Amen. Well, good morning, Grace Central Coast. My name is Jess Jantos. I'm the Women's Care Director here, and it's my honor to be worshiping with you online. Um, If you've just found us for the first time this Sunday, we're not asking you to give, but if you consider Grace Central Coast to be your home, there are three easy ways that you can give, and you can find those on the screen behind me. And as we're doing that, I want to highlight a really important ministry that we have here at Grace um, that you're giving benefits, and that is our tech ministry. Um, None of this would be possible without our tech team. And yet in the last year, our team has shrunk by 80%, um, which is a big number. And yet we've seen God be faithful um, and he's provided in really unexpected ways. One of these ways he's provided is by a young man named Jeremy, who is from our Five Cities campus. He started training with the tech team when he was in middle school. Um, And this last summer, when we transitioned to live outdoor services, he started taking over and being able to run the entire sound system at the Five Cities campus every Sunday. So you'll often see him back there. And a really neat thing about Jeremy is this summer, 
um, he has given every Friday morning to come and to do our live rec- our recordings for our online campus. So we're really grateful for his servant heart and the way that he stepped up to fill this hole um, in our tech ministry. So thank you to Jeremy and all of our tech volunteers. Uh, but the fact of the matter is one person doesn't fill 80% of a hole, and so we're still in need of volunteers, um, especially with two of our campuses that have now transitioned back to worshiping indoors. That means we have things like message slides and lyrics up on the screen, and in order to make those happen, we need more people. And so if you've been looking for a way to serve, um, this is just a really neat way to get involved. Uh, The tech team promises that they wouldn't just throw you in the first Sunday to figure it out on your own. You would be provided with lots of training, and so all that they ask is you come with a willing and teachable spirit, Um, but we'd love to have you join that team. And so if you're interested in joining at any of our four campuses, you can email eric at gracecentralcoast.org. That's Eric with a C. If you email Eric with a K, you might end up on youth team. Um, So we ask that you uh, consider joining that team. And so now, would you bow your heads and pray with me for a moment? Lord, we're, um, we're just so grateful uh, just for the ability to worship online um, that you've provided volunteers to come and run our tech each week, Lord, and so that we can have this time together um, online. And so we just pray that you would bless this ministry. Would you raise up more people? Would you raise up volunteers who want to get involved, Lord, and serve you in this way? Um, we just ask that you would fill this need. And now, Lord, as we transition to our time of um, our message, Lord, we just pray that you would speak through Pastor Tim um, as he just preaches and opens the word, uh, talking about your heart, Lord. May we um, be open to hearing what you have to say. Would you work in our hearts? Um, Change us, make us more like you, we ask and pray in your name. Amen. So for our scripture reading today, we will be reading from Hosea 11, verses 1 through 9. So you can grab your Bible, smartphone, however you read your Bible, but would you open with me now? So this is Hosea 11, 1 through 9. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jess. And uh, I, too, want to say welcome today. Thank you so much for worshiping with us again online at Grace Central Coast. This summer, we're exploring the heart of Jesus using this book uh, that we've been talking about each week. It's entitled Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland, And uh, we've invited you to read it along with us. We hope that you're doing that. Today, we're looking at this extraordinary heartfelt text in Hosea chapter 11. So I want to invite you, if you haven't yet, make sure you turn in a Bible to Hosea chapter 11. We're going to get there. It's going to take us a little bit, but we are going to get there. Make sure you grab that outline so that you can follow along, take some notes, write something down today. We believe that will make this message more sticky in your mind and heart and uh, will help you follow along. If I'm not mistaken, Hosea chapter 11, this text we're going to look at today, is the only Old Testament text so far in our series and really beyond today. And this really is such a revealing window into the heart of God. When we speak of the heart of God, 
let's be clear, we're also speaking about the heart of Jesus because the Bible teaches us that Jesus is God incarnate, God in human flesh. And so it's totally appropriate to say that Hosea 11 teaches us about the heart of Jesus. Well, here's where I want to begin before we get to Hosea 11. A couple of statements to get us thinking. And here's the first. You and I, we underestimate the wrath of God towards sinners apart from Christ. You know, the Bible speaks a lot about God's wrath towards sin. A lot. Jesus himself speaks about hell and eternal punishment way more than any other character in the Bible. And yet, when most of us run across these statements in the Bible about God's wrath and punishment, they almost don't compute in our minds and hearts. We, we just don't get it. The reality of God's wrath seems so far off, and therefore, God's wrath can seem to us so far-fetched. And let's be honest, we really don't like these statements. They're distasteful, they seem harsh, they're hard to understand, and so it's convenient to just ignore them. We can stick our fingers in our ears and say, la, 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 la. The reason I believe that we underestimate the wrath of God towards sinners apart from Christ is because we underestimate the offense of sin in the eyes of God. And the reason we underestimate the offense of sin is because we do not understand the character of God. God's holiness and righteousness. Now, if you've been here with us at Grace Central Coast for any length of time, this statement, this first statement, is a concept that we talk about fairly often. But now I want to give you a second statement, and here it is. We underestimate the wrath of God towards sinners apart from Christ, but that's not all. And we underestimate, uh, underestimate the compassion of God toward daughters and sons in Christ who sin. Now, while you're taking that in, let's make sure we see the distinction between the two statements. In the first statement, we're talking about God's wrath towards sinners apart from Christ. In the second statement, we're talking about God's compassion towards daughters and sons in Christ who sin. Now, if you're watching online and you would not identify today as a follower of Jesus, we're so glad that you're here. Here's, in a nutshell, very quickly, the Bible's big message, what the Bible teaches. First, God created us to know him, but humankind rebelled against God and chose to live apart from him. As a result, we are all sinners and rebels against God, both by birth and by long practice. But God in his amazing grace became a man in Jesus Christ. He entered into our world in order to bring us back to him. Jesus, the God man, lived the life that we should be living and died the death that we deserve. At the cross, the Bible teaches that the wrath of God, which we deserve, was poured out on Jesus instead. Jesus offers us forgiveness, a new relationship with God, and eternal life in him if we will own our own sin and turn to him. If we will say, I want your death to pay for my sin. If that happens, when that happens, a whole bunch of extraordinary things the Bible teaches happen to us. God makes rebels, we who were rebels, he makes us his sons and daughters. He brings us into his eternal family. He adopts us. We are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus. And over and over and over again, the Bible describes those who trust and follow Jesus as now being, the phrase is, in Christ. So before we go any further, here's the vital question. Are you in Christ? Are you certain of that fact today? If you've turned to Jesus and put your trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life, then the answer to that question for you is yes, you are definitely in Christ. If you've not yet trusted Christ, then you are today apart from Christ. And the Bible teaches that the wrath of God still hangs over your head. 
it still hangs over your life. If you won't turn to Jesus to pay the penalty for your sins, then whether you know it or not, you're actually choosing to pay that penalty yourself. And if that's you today, we want you to know that as a church, we will do anything and everything that we can to help you find and trust Jesus Christ. That's what our church is all about. We want to help people find and follow Jesus. We believe that finding Jesus and trusting Jesus is the most important and most impactful decision that you will ever make in your life. And so if that's you today, please, we want to just invite you to please reach out to one of our staff. We want to hear your story. We want to answer your questions. We want to work through your objections with you. For today and the rest of this message, we just want to encourage you to please Keep listening. As you do, write down your questions, the places where you're confused, and the things in today's message that don't make sense. I'm going to be addressing primarily from this point forward in the message those who are Christians, those who identify as Christians today. But we're so glad that you're here. Listen up as we move along. Now, look at that second statement again. We underestimate the wrath of God towards sinners apart from Christ, but... And we underestimate the compassion of God toward daughters and sons in Christ who sin. Christian, I want to ask you today, do you believe this second statement is true or not? I believe that that statement is true. And that's what I want to try to prove to you in the rest of this message. And so to move us along, here's a question. How do you think God, Jesus, responds when you sin. How do you think God responds? How do you think Jesus responds when you sin? When you sin, do you think that God is frustrated and angry with you, disgusted, shaking his head? Do you think that when you sin, Jesus moves away from you, distances himself from you, straight arms you? When you sin, do you think that Jesus is disappointed and ashamed of you? Is that how you think that God responds to you when you sin? If you and I think any of those things, then what I want to say to you is that we don't understand the heart of God. We vastly underestimate the compassion of God towards sons and daughters in Christ who sin. Now, I'm a parent of four wonderful, amazing kids. They also happen to be my kids, dreadful, broken sinners. And when they blow it in sin, these are the ways that I respond. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm shaking my head. I can distance myself from them. I can be disappointed and ashamed of them. Because guess what? I'm a dreadful, sinning, broken parent. That's who I am too. And yet as a parent, while all this is happening on the surface... At the same time, there's always something deeper going on in me. Even while I so often come off as frustrated and angry when my kids blow it or sin, at a deeper level, my heart is also breaking for them because they've blown it again. At the same time, deep inside, I'm moved with compassion because I know that this thing that they're doing is not good for them. I know that this thing is keeping them from God's best for them and all that God has made them to be. I feel compassion for my kids and I will do anything I can to help them grow forward and and really deal with and tackle this sin in their lives. This deeper part of my heart doesn't mean I excuse that sin or I overlook that sin or I don't discipline that sin. Rather, because I love my kids, I discipline them to help them move forward. But it's that deeper part of my heart, that compassion, that I'm convinced reflects the true heart of God toward us, sons and daughters in Christ, when we sin. Because God is not, like me, a dreadful, sinning, broken parent. God is a perfect parent. That compassion that's deep in me, that compassion that I feel for my kids when they sin, God's compassion toward us, his sons and daughters in Christ who sin, God's compassion is infinitely greater. 
Do you know that? Do you believe that? Do you feel that? You know, for me, I haven't always felt that. I haven't always believed that. But I believe it today. Now, you may say, you may be listening today, and you may say, I hear you, Pastor Tim. But I'm going to be honest with you, and I think you're overplaying this one a bit. You're saying that when I sin, God's primary, his first response to me is compassion. Not frustration, not anger, not disappointment. I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure I completely buy this. Pastor Tim, prove this to me. Show me this in the Bible. I want to believe it, but I'm not sure that I do. Well, I want to do just that in the rest of today's message, and that brings us to Hosea chapter 11. It's taken us a long time to get there, but now we're ready. And I want you to see with me four truths here in Hosea 11. And here's the first. God's relationship with his people is a father-son relationship. Hosea was one of Israel's prophets raised up by God to call the people of God out of their rebellion, their idolatry, and their sin. In Hosea 11, God is speaking of his relationship with Israel, and look at how he speaks. So look with me, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away, kept, kept sacrificing to the balls and burning offerings to idols. Yet, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. There are moments in my interactions with my kids when I will say, I don't know you don't remember this or you don't even think about this, but you came from me. In a sense, I made you, your mom and I. I held you in my arms. I rocked you to sleep late at night. I fed you. And guess what? I wiped your bottom. God is doing the exact same thing here. God's people, Israel, they were God's son. He brought them into this world. He nurtured them and cared for them. He raised them up. God's saying, I provided for you. I've been a father to you. You've been my son. Hosea is addressed to God's Old Testament people. But everything that God says to them also applies to us, New Testament Christian. Because in the Bible, Israel is this massive metaphor. God's salvation of Israel is a type and a shadow of his salvation for us in Jesus. Remember how we talked about this throughout our Life of Moses series? The reality is, we're Israel, and their salvation and relationship with God has so much to teach us about our salvation and relationship with God in Jesus. Just like Israel, God has also brought us into new life. He's made us his sons and daughters, through the salvation work of Jesus. I want to make sure that as we look at Hosea 11, we make this connection and we see ourselves in this text. Here's truth number two. I bet you saw it in the verses we just read. God's people are bent on turning away from him. Despite God's nurturing love and tender care, God's people, they continually spurn God. They turn away from God to other gods, lesser gods. God's people blow God off in every way. Look at verse 2 again. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the balls and burning offerings to idols. I mean, that is heartbreaking, isn't it? Verse 7, my people are bent on turning away from me. They're bent on turning away from me. Do you feel the heartbreak in God, the pathos, the pain? And every parent has felt this with their kids at different moments. Some parents have felt this intensely over a long period of time. But this too is us, God's people today. We too are bent on turning away from him. We may not worship 
and bow down to graven images, but we bow our hearts to the false gods of our time. Money, materialism, power, pleasure, work, even government or family, and so many more. You and I, we have daily sins that are so woven into who we are that we don't even notice them. We have besetting sins that we just can't seem to shake. We have our secret sins that we work so hard to hide. And though God has acted so radically, so dramatically, and so graciously in Jesus to bring us back to him and to save us, it's so easy for us to take it all for granted. Our salvation can become so ho-hum in our lives, nothing special. And so there's no joy, there's no passion, there's no love for God, there's no pursuit of God. But this is not the end of the story in Hosea 11. Look at the surprise in verse 8. Hosea chapter 11, verse 8. Here's God's response. You know, he feels this father-son relationship with Israel, his people. But he sees that their hearts are bent away from him. And here is his response. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zobium? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. Here's truth number three. Despite their continual rebellion, this is the surprise. God's compassion grows warm and tender toward his people. It's utterly unexpected. God's people, because of their rebellion, they deserve to be destroyed. They deserve to be utterly wiped off the face of the planet. God would be perfectly just in doing so. But that, surprisingly, is not God's response. You see, his, his, God's compassion actually grows in response to his people and their sin. God's compassion grows warm and tender. Did you see it? My compassion, in verse, uh, end of verse 8, my compassion grows warm and tender. It's not that the anger isn't in there too. It is. God refers to it as a burning anger. But God will not execute his burning anger. He will not destroy his people. His compassion wins out over his anger. His mercy triumphs over his judgment. Why? Because these are God's people. His people. Israel, remember, is his son. God is their father. And God feels compassion for his people like only a parent can. And so they're protected from the full fury of God's just wrath. Will God still discipline Israel? Will God still discipline his people? Yes, in his love to help them grow, God will discipline his people. And it's clear in other parts of this text. But God will not utterly destroy his people. He will not wipe them off the face of the planet. And there's a big difference. God's kids are shielded from the full fury of his just wrath. His response to his kids is primarily one of compassion because he is bound to them, he has bound himself to them as a father. He's a father to his children. And what is true for Old Testament Israel in Hosea 11 is also true for us New Testament Christians. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, then you are a child of God, and he's bound you to him as a father. He's bound you to him as a father. And when we sin, and who doesn't? We sin. But now, because we're in Christ as his kids, a son or daughter, we are now shielded protected from the full fury of his wrath. More than that, God's primary, first, leading response to us when we sin is compassion. A compassion that grows warm and tender when we sin. I don't know about you, but this is so hard to believe. 
because this is not how we respond. This is not how I respond when my kids sin or when others sin. But this is how God responds. And this is what the Bible teaches in Hosea 11. Psalm 103 says it this way. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Why? What is this? It's because of that father-son, that father-child relationship. And look at this. Why does he show compassion? For he knows our frame. He remembers that we're but dust. Paul says it this way in Romans 5. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The more we sin, the more God's grace, God's mercy, God's compassion grows. The more it flows, the more it abounds. So what do you think? Are you buying it? Am I convincing you? I hope I'm at least making you think. Well, there's one more truth in Hosea 11 that we need to see, and it too is shocking. Look at Hosea 11.9 one more time with me to see it. Hosea 11.9, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Do you see? That's a curveball. That's not what I expect. I would have expected, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, therefore I will come in wrath. I will execute my burning anger. I will destroy Ephraim. Because I almost always associate God's holiness with his wrath. Don't you? But God here in Hosea 11 actually says the opposite. And so here's the truth we learn. Because of his holiness... God's compassion grows, and he will not come in wrath to destroy his people. It really is shocking. Verse 8 and 9 flow into one another, and they're connected. God's compassion grows warm and tender. Where does that come from? Because of his holiness. And these, because of God's holiness and his compassion, these are why God will not wipe out Israel. This is the shock. God's holiness is the wellspring of his compassion toward his children when they sin. I don't know if I've ever thought about this before. I'm very sure I've never understood this before. How can that be? Why can that be? Well, here's how I understand Hosea 11.9. Listen carefully. Because God is holy, he knows infinitely more about the evil of sin and the ravaging effects of sin. God knows infinitely more what sin does to us, what sin does to others, what sin does to the world. And in response to what God knows about the impact of sin, because God knows it, how this is affecting us, God's compassion grows. He hates that sin and the damage it's causing in us, in others, and in the world, but he so loves the sinner. He's committed to his beloved son and daughters in Christ. He's committed to his people because he's a father to them. Do you see? God's holy infinite understanding of sin is the wellspring of his infinite compassion for us when we see, when we sin. That's how I understand Hosea 11.9. God's compassion flows from his holiness, his infinite understanding of sin. Now, I'm aware, so much to process today, and you may be still processing If that's what's happening for you, that's what I want to happen. That's okay. That's good. But as we close, I want to take it one step further, and I want to ask you this question. What if this is true? All that we've said today, all that we've seen today in Hosea 11, what if God's first, his primary response to us when we sin is compassion? What if this is true? What difference can this make in our lives? What difference should this make in our lives? 
Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Let's say this first. God's compassion and grace when we sin must not cause us to sin more. If God's compassion grows and flows when we sin, then the the natural question to ask is, why not sin some more? Well, did you know that the Apostle Paul answers this very question in Romans 6, verse 1? Here's what he says. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Like if grace flows when we sin, then let's sin some more. His answer, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul is saying that the very opposite ought to be true. I think Paul is pointing here. Here's the second thing I want you to think about. God's compassion and grace when we sin should cause us to come running back to Jesus quicker because we're so assured of his love and care. We don't have to fear God's anger or disappointment. We don't have to hide in shame. We can come running back quick. We don't have to stay away for long. So so, uh, do you hear what I'm saying? If we're assured, if we believe this, if we buy this, that God's response to us when we sin is compassion, that should cause us to run back to Jesus when we sin quicker rather than staying away. And I think there's one more way that this can and should affect our lives. God's compassion and grace when we sin should make us less defensive and denying of our sin and more free and willing to see it and own it. Do you see why this is so? When we're afraid, we hide. We deny and we defend. I mean, just think back on the garden, Genesis chapter 1. But if we believe that God is compassionate when we sin, then we're free to more easily and readily admit our sin and own our sin when it, when in, it inevitably happens. You and I, we're going to sin all the time. And our natural response is to deny and hide and be defensive. But if we're assured of God's compassion, then we don't need to be. We can, be, we can own our sin. We can see it quicker. We can repent faster. And we can just let down our defenses. And we can do this both with God, but also with one another. Uh, just a little insight into our marriage. Susie and I, we've been married almost 30 years. And I would say that our besetting sin in our marriage, the big struggle in our marriage, is we're both just so defensive. We're just, we just don't own our sin as quick or as readily as we might. And I was so challenged by this as I thought about God's response to us when we sin. If God's response is really compassion, then we don't need to be so defensive. You see, God's compassion when we sin can lead us to a glorious freedom. So let's end right where we started with these two statements. Do you remember? I think both these things are true. We underestimate the wrath of God towards sinners apart from Christ. And we underestimate the compassion of God toward daughters and sons in Christ who sin. I think both those things are true. What do you think? Do you buy it now? Still processing? I want to give you the freedom to do so. As you do, here's a couple of next steps, ways that you can take this message further, continue to process, and apply it to your life. All right? Here's next step number one this week. In light of this text and message, sit in the question. How do you really think God responds when you sin? Just take that question in, sit in it for a while. And then what difference would it make if you could really believe that God moves toward you in compassion and tenderness when you sin? We've talked about that. I just want to challenge you to keep going, keep processing that and what this could mean in your life. Here's next step number two this week. What can you do to access and express your own deep compassion and tenderness? Remember I talked about how that's deep in me. It's not always my first response, but it is in there. It's in you too. 
So you've got it. You've got that deep compassion and tenderness in you. How can you access that and express that the next time someone that you care about, it might be your kid, it might be your spouse, it might be a friend, someone you care about blows it or sins? How can we go there? We're to be merciful as God is merciful. And so how can we be like God in this? All right, a couple of next steps. Final one, it's not on your outline there, but I I just want to say it again. The springboard uh, for this message was Gentle and Lowly, this book once more, chapter seven. And so as you're processing, if you're still processing, I want to challenge you to jump in and read slowly Gentle and Lowly, chapter 7. I think that will help you as you process. So let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for the richness of your word. We thank you for this little treasure nugget way back in Hosea chapter 11, a text I've really never processed or taught, but what a sweet text. What a great reminder. So much deep truth even here about your response to your people when we sin. We thank you that you're our father, that you've made us your kids, and that in Christ we're protected from the full fury of your wrath towards sin. We thank you that you see us and you feel for us like a father has compassion on his kids. Help us believe that. Help us believe that your first response, because you're not a sinning, broken father, is one of compassion toward us when we sin. We just admit, we confess, we've got such a hard time believing that because that's not the way we respond, but it is the way you respond. I pray for those who are still processing today. Uh, May you help them in this journey. Uh, May we keep learning and growing and searching your word together. I pray for any who might be participating today, watching online, in the service today, who can say, I'm not in Christ. I don't identify as a Christian. I pray that you'd help them see that apart from Christ, the wrath of God hangs over their life and they need you. And we just want to help in any way we can to keep working in their lives through those objections and questions. And and we want to help however however we can. So we pray for our friends today. We look to you. Help us to be more like you as we take in and internalize this truth. May it also be lived out in our lives toward our kids, our spouses, our friends, those who sin against us. May our first response be one of compassion. We confess to you, it is not always that, but make it so, we ask and pray, Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you again for worshiping with us, and uh, as we wrap up our service, I want to invite Pastor Chris to take us on home. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Tim, for that important and powerful reminder today. Um, well, before we go, I have just a couple things. We mentioned this the past two weeks. This is our third week. We are presenting David Beals as an elder candidate. Um, per our church constitution, he needs to be presented to the congregation for three consecutive weeks. Uh, and so if you guys have any feedback, if you know uh, David Beals uh, or if you've interacted with him at all, feel free to reach out. Elders at graceandtracos.org. They'd love to know. Um, your relationship with Dave. Uh, also would love to, uh, really excited to announce we have two little ones that were just added to our church family. Uh, little Frankie Way was born this past week. She weighed in at eight pounds, five ounces, 21 and three quarters inches long. Her proud parents, Zach and Hannah and older siblings, Forrest, Fern and Finley are doing well. Also this week, Aspen Sema was born to Connor and Rebecca. She weighed seven pounds, 10 ounces, 20.5 inches long. So, so excited for those babies to be born into our church family. And uh, so excited to hopefully meet them soon. With that, uh, why don't you stand wherever you're at? We're going to read with and to each other uh, God's word as we send each other off into the week. From Psalm 33, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Have a great week. Hi, kids. I am Marina, early childhood coordinator at Grace Central Coast San Luis Obispo Campus. Today, we're going to sing some songs, watch a Bible story video, and hear questions from kids. Ready? Let's get started. Hey kids, welcome to Sing Along Songs, the part of the show where you sing along while we sing a song. Today I brought a friend to help me along. 
Today I've brought a friend to help me. Hey, what's your name, sir? My name's Bernard. Bernard, are you excited to sing with us today? No, not really. Well, we're going to give it our best shot for the kids, aren't we, Bernard? We'll see. All right. This song is called Kangaroos Like Me. All right? Let's learn it together. I like kangaroos. They're a lot like me. There's no animal that I'd rather be. Not a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea. Just a kangaroo for me. disciple, John, wrote a letter to Christians. Little children, he wrote, because all Christians are children of God. I am writing to you so you will not sin, but if you do sin, Jesus speaks to the Father for us. Jesus died to take the punishment for our sins. John said that when we are a part of God's family and truly know God, we keep God's commands. Being a child of God is like living in light instead of in darkness. John wrote, If someone says he is in the light, but hates his brother or sister, he is in the darkness. If someone loves his brother or sister, he is in the light. John also wrote, See how much the Father loves us. He calls us his own children. And that is what we are. We are children of God. John said that people who are God's children live differently than people who are not God's children. Believers do what is right, and they love one another. This was not a new message. Jesus told us to love one another too. John wrote that others will know we are Christians because we show love to one another. We know what love is because Jesus showed us. He laid down his life for us. Because of Jesus' power, we can and should love like that too. When we have something that our brother needs, we should give it to him. If someone has enough to help but turns away and does nothing, does that person really know God's love? John said that we must not just talk about loving others. We must love them by our actions and by telling them the truth. Little children, he said, let us not just say that we love others, let's show our love by what we do. John wrote a letter to teach believers in the church, the children of God, about the importance of showing love. Love is more than feelings or words, it is an action. Jesus showed God's love for us when he died on the cross to rescue people from sin. Hey there, I'm Pastor Brian, and it's time for questions from kids. Caroline from Prattville, Alabama asks, What does it mean that God is our Father? Caroline, as we know, God is really hard for us to understand at times because He's not human like we are, of course. He's infinite. Um, you know, you read about Him in the Scripture, and He's just 
really hard to understand at times. And so what God has done is he's given us different ways to understand him throughout scripture. And the best way to understand him is by looking at all these things together. So for example, we know in scripture it says that God is king. Well, from that we know that he leads us. He's a ruler, he has authority. But that's not the only way he's described. He's also described, as you've asked, as a father. So what do we think about when we think about God as the Father? I think it's really helpful for us to remember that that really means that he has a loving relationship with us as his children. When we think about God the Father, we should immediately think of God loving us, caring for us, providing for us. What's interesting is this was the term that Jesus used of God most often in the Gospels. If you read through the Gospels, you really don't see Jesus calling God King, you see him calling God Father. Why? Because that loving relationship was so important. It's so central to who God is. So God as Father really helps us remember this central, really important attribute of God of love. Isn't that a good thing? It's an encouraging thing that God wants to know us. He wants us to love him as he loves us. Does he want us to obey him? Sure, but it's not obedience that has nothing to do with love. It's obedience because of love. So here's a question back for you. What would be different if God were just a king over us and not our heavenly father? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your hands. All right. All right, so let's try it together. You guys sing along at home. And uh, this is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Ready? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Good times, good hanging, good lessons, good friends, good hats. We'll see you later. We are so glad you joined us here today. I am Marina, Early Childhood Coordinator at Grace Central Coast San Luis Obispo Campus. Our kids ministry team is committed to bringing the good news of the gospel into your homes and helping you disciple your kids. For more information or resources or to contact us, go to gracecentralcoast.org. See you next week.